Think working out has to be hard? Well, think again. HIIT workouts appear to do the impossible by helping you burn more calories than a 40-minute run in a quarter of the time. Better yet, they also build muscle, improve athletic performance and give you more energy. They've been transforming the lives of people all around the world and if you want to achieve one of those cover model physiques, then this is probably just what you're looking for. Ready to get started with the most highly effective and efficient workouts on the planet? Then let's get started. Along the way, we'll discover that there's a lot more to HIIT than just the basic alternating speeds. We'll learn some advanced techniques like cardio acceleration, fartlek training, speed drills, concurrent training, metacon, tabata, finishers and more. Let's HIIT it. If you want to build muscle, you need to cause muscle damage and metabolic stress. By lifting weights, you can cause a build-up of damage and this will provide precisely the stimulation you need to trigger muscle growth during rest. To lose fat, improve your fitness and get better health though, you need to use cardiovascular training. Cardiovascular training is any type of training that involves exerting yourself for an extended period of time. Very often this will mean running long distances, with jogging perhaps being the most popular form of cardio training. Not far behind though are swimming, cycling, skipping, rowing and others. Traditionally, this kind of cardiovascular training has been steady state. That means you put on your running shoes, you step out the door and you run for about 40 to 60 minutes. It's steady state because you're maintaining a steady level of exertion throughout the course of the exercise. In this case, you're jogging at a set pace and then maintaining that pace. For a long time, this was thought to be the very best way to burn the maximum number of calories and to improve fitness. There was a good theory behind why this should be the case. Specifically, it was thought that there was an optimal fat burning zone and that this could be found at roughly 70% of your maximum heart rate. This makes sense in theory, seeing as faster than 70% of your MHR will put you past your anaerobic threshold. In other words, you will be running so fast that you wouldn't be able to rely on your aerobic energy system for fuel. You simply couldn't burn fat quickly enough and so you will be forced to rely on energy stored in your muscles as ATP and glycogen. It would appear to make sense then that running at 70% of your MHR and maintaining the maximum pace at which the body burns fat should result in the maximum weight loss. But this isn't what modern research has found. HIIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training and it completely turns this concept on its head. In HIIT, you actually alternate between bursts of intense exertion, such as sprinting, and periods of relatively low intensity exercise, like jogging or power walking. This way, you are switching from your anaerobic energy system to your aerobic system and back. Switching between burning energy stored in your blood and muscles and energy stored as fat. But what makes this so effective is what happens after the anaerobic training. When you exert yourself maximally by sprinting or exercising otherwise at 100%, you can deplete any energy that might have been available from sources other than fat. This means your body can only burn fat for energy, you know, there's no other option remaining. Thus, you will then burn even more fat during the aerobic portions of the exercise. And when you finish and go home, you will continue to burn fat stores because you'll be low on store glycogen. This is what some people refer to as the afterburn effect, and it means that after an intensive session of HIIT, you can continue to burn more calories for the entire remainder of the day. As we saw in the last video, HIIT is able to burn more calories than steady state cardio. 
And because you're exerting yourself more at certain points throughout your trading, you should also finish in a much shorter space of time. Typically, an HIIT session can last between 10 to 20 minutes and be just as effective in terms of calories burned as a 40-minute run. For those who have a busy and hectic work schedule then, HIIT training is the ideal solution and allows them to squeeze in a few short minutes of highly effective training to get amazing results. There are more reasons to get excited about HIIT too. When looking at any type of training program, what's always useful to keep in mind is the SAID principle. This means specific adaptations to impose demands. It means that your body changes to adapt the demands placed on it. If you train at altitude, you become better at training at altitude. If you jog, you become better at jogging. Thus, HIIT makes you better at high intensity activities, which include sprinting, running, rowing, boxing, wrestling, play fighting, sports, moving furniture and more. These are the things that we are much more likely to utilize in our daily lives and that makes this a more adaptive and more useful form of training. Whereas steady state cardio makes you more effective at long slogs, HIIT makes you explosive and athletic. This also creates a number of other great advantages too. For instance, HIIT has been shown to help improve the efficiency and number of mitochondria. Mitochondria are tiny energy factories that live inside all our cells and have the critical role of creating and utilizing ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. This is the most fundamental form of energy in the human body and it's what fuels all our movements as well as our thoughts. More mitochondria means greater energy efficiency. That means yet more athletic performance and even more brain power. Your brain cells have mitochondria too. Ever wondered why little kids seem to run in circles all day without getting tired while older generations get exhausted from getting up to turn on the TV? One of the big reasons for this discrepancy is the difference in the number and efficiency of mitochondria. This also improves your VO2 max, which is the amount of oxygen you're capable of using. The greater your VO2 max, the more efficient you become at oxygenating your body. This is one of the biggest indicators of physical fitness and one of the things that athletes are encouraged to focus on in their training. But perhaps the best of all is that the kind of explosive movement used in HIIT will invariably engage your fast twitch muscle fiber. These are the muscle fibers that contain more mitochondria and that are responsible for delivering rapid power. They're also the biggest type of muscle fibers and the ones that will make you look like a bodybuilder. If you engage in steady state cardio, then you can risk converting your fast twitch muscle fiber into slow twitch fiber. Why? Because you're placing high energy demands on your body over a long duration and thus your body will want to move the ratio towards the most efficient form of muscle fibre. What's more is that you create a highly catabolic environment that, in short, starves your body of fuel and forces it to break down both fat and muscle. This is why most long distance runners also happen to be stick thin. But when you engage your fast twitch muscle fibers, you show your body that you need explosiveness and you shorten the length of the catabolic period. This in turn means that you don't risk breaking down muscle tissue in the same way, allowing you to create a physique that is hard, ripped and powerful. Women can expect tone definition, while men can expect rippling vascularity and striations. That's why, as we stated earlier, this is the preferred weight loss strategy of cover models and celebrities. So let's recap. This is a form of training that is quicker than conventional steady state cardio, able to burn a much greater number of calories in a shorter time, able to create an afterburn effect for increased metabolism throughout the day, effective in increasing energy levels, effective in protecting muscle against deterioration for a leaner, harder physique, and excellent for your all-round health. 
Oh, and did we mention that it's also highly versatile and practical and can be performed anywhere? Yep, that's pretty much why people love HIIT. Let's introduce it into your routine, shall we? Just before we do that, though, let's take a closer look at the science. Yep, boring, I know, but it will be crucial in helping you to really understand what you're doing rather than just following a routine blindly. And we'll do that in the next video. Let's first consider how the body gets energy and manages that energy during exertion. First, in order to exercise, the body needs energy. This energy comes from a source known as ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, which is described in scientific circles as the energy currency of life. This substance is a nucleotide made up of three phosphogen molecules bonded together by a powerful force. That's what the name literally means, tri meaning three, phosphate meaning phosphogen. All types of energy in the body are ultimately converted into ATP, so when you eat a big cake, the sugar and glucose will ultimately need to be converted into this molecule before it can be of any use to your muscles or your cells. In real terms, any one mole of ATP energy will provide 7.3 calories. It would take just over 190 micromoles to move your index finger enough to click a mouse button on a computer, and this would equate to around 1.42 calories. The power in this substance, however, doesn't come from the phosphogen itself, but from the powerful bonds that bind it together. And it's when these bonds break that they unleash the energy that the body can utilize. An athlete needs to be able to supply their muscles with a lot of ATP then in order to perform the necessary movements for running or weightlifting. And there are three ways in which they can do this. The first way the body gets ATP is through the phosphogen system. This is also known as the ATP-CP system, which uses the ATP stored in muscles to supply that energy. The body can store enough ATP at any one time to allow for around three seconds of full-powered exertion, a little more or a little less, depending on your physical fitness and various other factors at which point it will need to look elsewhere. Fortunately, breaking the ATP molecules results in some useful byproducts. ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate, with two and one bonded phosphogen molecules respectively. So if you imagine you have three bonded molecules and they break, you will understandably be left with a one and a two, or three single molecules. You know, it's basic maths. The good news is that using a substance called creatine phosphate, hence the CP, can then recombine these molecules to make them back into ATP, ready to be broken once more for extra energy. The body can store enough creatine for roughly 8 to 10 seconds of continued exertion, meaning that in total the body can use the phosphogen system for around 13 seconds maximum of continued exertion. That is enough to sprint just over 100 meters. It is thought, however, that through the use of creatine supplements, this maximum time can be increased marginally. At this point, if exertion continues, the body needs to get its ATP from somewhere else, and this is where it looks into its stored carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. This represents the shift to what is known as the glycogen lactic acid system. This system is a slightly slower and less efficient means of supplying energy, which requires the body to split the glycogen first into glucose and then again into ATP. This unfortunately creates a number of unwanted byproducts called metabolites, including lactic acid, from which the substance takes its name. This metabolic buildup creates the uncomfortable, mildly painful burning sensation we get in our muscles when we push ourselves in the gym. 
The body can sustain itself using the glycogen lactic acid system for a further 1 minute and 30 seconds until this build-up becomes too much to tolerate. If we continue to try and push ourselves at MHR past this point, it can lead to nausea and even fainting. It was long believed that lactic acid was actually responsible for this failure and for the burning sensation. However, more recent research has shown us that lactate is not harmful in itself, but rather seems to correlate with other factors that fatigue the glycogen lactic acid system. Thus, high-level athletes can still monitor their buildup of lactate in the blood in order to calculate a lactate inflection point. With training, it's possible to improve tolerance to metabolites and thus sustain maximum exertion for longer. And guess what you can use to improve this aspect of your fitness? You guessed it, HIIT. Both these systems are anaerobic, meaning that for the first 1 minute and 43 seconds, the body won't be using oxygen or burning fat. In order to lose weight, the training must continue past this point and force the body to find its energy elsewhere. This is where the aerobic system comes in, relying on the oxidization of foodstuffs in our mitochondria. In other words, the body looks to our supplies of glycogen, and so ATP, stored in our cells as fat and then uses the oxygen in our blood to break them down and carry them to our muscles. This leads to fat being burned directly. It forces us to breathe more heavily in order to supply the necessary amount of oxygen and it increases our heart rate further to transport the oxygen to the fat stores and then to bring the energy to our muscles and brain. The aerobic energy system can actually be used indefinitely and will continue until you completely exhaust all supplies of energy located around the body. During a typical prolonged endurance test, you will find you also break down protein for energy and even muscle. This is in contrast to high-intensity exercises that will use 100% carbohydrates for fuel purely because they provide the quickest and most accessible source of ATP. So, if you head outside and start jogging, you'll notice that, at first, you don't need to gasp for breath in order to maintain your speed, and your heart rate doesn't immediately go crazy. That's because you're using your ATP-CP system. If you continue with this exertion, though, you'll switch to your glycogen lactic acid system. This will use up energy stored as glycogen in the muscles. This will lead to an increase in lactate and metabolites in the muscles and the bloodstream, leading to nausea, muscle pain, cramping and more. It's at this point that things become uncomfortable. If you're running fast, you will continue to use this system until you eventually pass out, and this is our lactate threshold, or your lactate inflection point. This is the point at which the build-up of lactate and metabolites becomes too great for you to maintain that level of exercise. This will happen before you have completely exhausted the stored glycogen in the muscles. But most of us will instead find we are forced to slow down before we reach our inflection point and switch to the aerobic system. We will drop to sub-maximal exertion triggered by the physical symptoms and will find a steady pace at around 70% of our maximum heart rate. This will mean we have time to burn fat for fuel, which will require heavy breathing and a high heart rate, but which won't lead to the same levels of discomfort. If you were training with steady-state cardio, you will continue this level of exertion indefinitely and stop after you've burned a satisfactory number of calories. Following this, your body would then continue to use a combination of all three systems for tasks throughout the remainder of the day. Low blood sugar, however, would trigger a release of the hunger hormone ghrelin, and this will be accompanied by cortisol, the stress hormone. This is why we're always stressed when we're hungry. This would also correlate with an increase in myostatin, an unpopular molecule that leads to an increased breakdown of muscle. This is on top of the increased protein breakdown during the exercise itself. But if you utilize HIIT, 
you will use the aerobic system for a set period of time, giving your body enough time to clear the lactate buildup in your bloodstream, and then you will switch back to the maximum exertion to further deplete the glucose stores. This will mean you are taking a small break from burning fat and blood sugar, thus reducing the negative impact on your mood and muscle mass. Moreover, it would mean you could almost entirely empty your glycogen stores and thereby force your body to use blood sugar and fat stores for even the simplest movements for a long period afterwards while it creates more glycogen.